Boston Conservatory of Berkeley. Please take a moment to silence all cell phones and other electronics. Flash book number two and video guarantee are prohibited. So in case of emergency, you can exit through the doors of the lot. So thank you and enjoy the show. Um, it's really our pleasure to be able to present this recital to you. It's called Unheard. Um, it's a history of women composers. So I want to introduce my friend. This is John. Jonathan. Yes. He's going to play with, with all of us, most of us today. Um, okay, so um, today we are going to explore some significant women composers over the centuries. And we'll start off with Francesca Puccini. She was born in 1587 and has an unknown death date. <laughs> she was a singer, composer, teacher, and multi-instrumentalist, very talented, playing the harp, tiobo, lute, harpsichord, and other instruments. She was also the eldest daughter of Giulio Caccini. Society in that time required that women consider marriage, motherhood, and household work their life's vocation. Academic, artistic, or music musically talented women were almost always prodigies who retreated into obscurity before the age of 20. Caccini was fortunate, however, as the turn of the century saw the rise of opera and monody. And the well-trained soprano was the favorite voice for most of the solo vocal music. So she made her debut at 13 years old in Yura Dice, written by Giacomo Perri, one of Caccini's uh, contemporaries. Because of her family background, she attended meetings by the Italian academies, which are societies of intellectuals under aristocratic sponsorship, which discuss literature, philosophy, and music. Membership was all male, but we had and they had female singers perform at the meeting. So Caccini's wit, intellect, and effective power of a song actually was. Um, noticed by the Grand Duchess Christine de Lorraine of Tuscany, who actually arranged for her to further her compositional nil skills and arrange a marriage to Giovanni Battista Signorini as a precondition to her being paid as a salary court musician in 1607. Kind of like, what? Okay. So during, during her service in the Medici court, she wrote at least 15 theatrical works as well as vocal chamber music. She also composed the first ever opera by a woman composer, La Liberazione di Ruggiero dall'Isola dal Cina, well, that was a mouthful, in 1625. So um, today I'll be singing one of the songs from one of the most extensive um, song collections by a woman, um, Il Primo Libro delle Musiche, Musiche, in 1618. This is also the year that her father died, so it was actually kind of dedicated to him, even though it wasn't said in the book. In this um, book, um, there's two sections, the spirituali and temporali, which is secular, so um, spiritual and secular. And the songs follow many forms of the period, which is strophic variations and strophic. This was also used as a pedagogy book for the ladies at that time, which is quite interesting. <coughs> so the song I'll be singing is Keto Fatio, which has a unique compositional, which shows her unique compositional style, which is dissonances with almost no preparation, very daring harmonies at that time. And also, she wrote up all her ornamentation and reserved them only for accented words, internal breaks in the line, or penultimate syllables. So also, as emotional intensity increases, she puts a brick in the poetic line. I hope you'll enjoy it. Oh. 
I must reverently consecrate this first work, which as a woman I publish all too boldly, to the most august name of your highness, so that, under an oak of gold, it may rest secure against the lightning bolts of slander prepared for it. So this just goes to show the kind of backlash she received um, from composing music during this time. And this song that I'll be singing, uh, Spesso per entro al petto, um, was published in 1651 in uh, her book Cantate, Ariete e Duetti, book number two. And um, it's a strop, strophic song, it has three stanzas, and we're going to be singing two. Um, and um, it's a song that it highlights the sensual torments of love. And after I sing, Ariana Simon will be singing another Strozzi piece, Amor do Milione, accompanied by Maggie Madsen on the cello, and it's also from the same book of songs um, that was published in 1651. So I hope you enjoy.
Mendelssohn Hensel, and she was born in Hamburg, Germany, and she was Felix Mendelssohn's older sister. Um, and the siblings both uh, had very similar music educations. They studied theory and composition and piano. And she was a piano virtuoso. And this was a time when women were encouraged to be able to play the piano very well. Um, because this came about the, uh, during the Romantic period. Uh, there was a big interest in piano music. Um, and her brother encouraged Fanny to compose music, but not to publish it. And her father also shared this sentiment. Even though she often helped shape some of Felix's own pieces, such as his 1837 St. Paul Oratorio, and she was not even included in a music dictionary that was published in the 1980s. In a letter to 23-year-old Fanny on her birthday, her father wrote, you must become more stead and collected and prepare more earnestly and eagerly for your real calling, the only calling of a young woman, I mean the state of a housewife. Um, so Fanny really, um, she took this to heart and it kind of discouraged, it did discourage her from publishing her music for a long time. But despite this, at the time of her death, she had accomplished nearly 500 uh, compositions, although she did not have a career as a composer. Only a very small amount of her music was published, about 11 opuses and about 16 single pieces without opus number. She also composed a piano trio and solo piano works and leader. Um, so she was discouraged from performing in public, although she did play at concerts hosted by the Mendelssohn family in their home every Sunday. And she also became a central figure in a flourishing salon for which she created most of her compositions and where she performed her pieces on the piano. Her only non-public performance was in 1838 when she played her brother's first piano concerto at a charity benefit. Um, and in 1829 she married Wilhelm Hensel, who was a respected portrait painter, and he supported her career, as did her mother. And as Mrs. Hensel, she organized and hosted concerts in her home and became a part of the Berlin music scene. And her first published compositions were three liter and they were published under Felix's name in 1827. And her own name didn't appear on her published music until 10 years later. Um, and in 1846, the year before her death, Fanny allowed the publication of two books of songs for voice and piano, four books of piano music, and one book of part songs, and they were met with immediate success. And although he didn't encourage her uh, performance career, career, Felix did describe her songs as being more beautiful than anyone can say, the quintessence, the soul of music, I know no better. Um, so her music is known for its lyricism, um, it's neo-Bachian procedures and it's attention to craftsmanship and the text. Um, and um, this, her songs are lyrical with broad line melodies of extensive, extensive range. And this song that I'm about to sing, Warum sind denn die Rosen so blass, was written, the text was written by Heinrich Heine, who was a German Jewish poet, journalist, and literary critic, and he is best known for his early lyric poetry, which was set to leaders such as this. And this is a very romantic text in that it compares the, the nature and the bleak landscape to the despondency of a lost love. And I think she's really sensitive to the text in this, and it's really nice to sing, so I hope you enjoy it. <laughs>
is um, the Amon Komstil Gagailin. It, is, it sounds like a lullaby and the poet describes the beauty of nature. The text is written by Emmanuel Geibel, a German poet and playwright. I hope you enjoy it. Symphony. 
This was especially important because she was the one, um, she received all her training in the United States. Um, a child prodigy who could sing tunes at one year, one year old, <laughs> and, and could play music by ear on the piano at four. Um, her family relocated to Boston in 1875, and she made her piano debut at 16 years old with the BSO. Impressive. <laughs> she married um, um, a, a medical uh, professional, Henry Harris Aubrey Beach. So her husband wanted her to be a wife and not a concert pianist. So she didn't perform in public except for charity functions and all the fees were donated to charity. I mean, her husband was rich, so I guess they could do that. <laughs> so, um, after her marriage, she was known as Mrs. H. H. A. Beach. So if you see all the anthologies and books, you'll see that signature there. She composed 300 works, including 128 songs for poems, and almost all of them were published. This was almost unheard at that time. Okay, after her husband's death in 1911, however, she went to Europe to establish a name for herself. This is actually a little throwback to Clara Schumann when her husband passed away and she went to go on to perform. This was, however, cut short by the, out by, by the outbreak of World War II, which made her return to the U.S. So she continued performing around the, the, the country and became really, really famous. So she was deemed to be a heroine to Amer many American women for her trailblazing spirit. Um, a musicologist wrote this, unfortunately. Despite her many successes, much contemporary critical commentary dwelt on the fact that Beach was a woman, hence her works could not be compared to those of her mainstream male composers. That's unfortunate. <laughs> she set poems of Shakespeare, Hugo, Goethe, Heine, very famous composers, and which kind of is a throwback to German Romanticism. So um, you can see this in her music. So the texts that she set reflect Beach's love for nature and connect natural elements to themes of life and death and earthly versus heavenly love, characteristic of German Romanticism. Known for her ability to create long lines with sensitivity to music and text as well as her use of chromaticism. So it's really interesting because um, this Three Browning Songs, which is probably one of her most famous sets for songs, the first one was written while she was in a train. So actually you can hear the acceleration of train in the accompaniment. Um, this rhythmic drag propels the text forward to the climatic ending, and the triplet figure gives a youthful ardor and exuberance reflecting the hopefulness of spring. The second song I'll sing is I Love But A Day. It is, draws similarities to a brown song. It is set in F minor key, and the text is about a person losing um, interest in their marriage and expressing the uncertainty of love. Um, in the second section, however, it changes to an F major tonality, which creates a sense of optimism, showing a glimmer of hope that maybe love will endure this hardship. Um, the second re reiteration of Look in My Eyes text, um, Beach uses D flat major, which is an unfamiliar tonality with a familiar text that you hear before. So the text ends with a question, leaving us all wondering if love really does endure this harsh show. I hope you enjoy the song.
talk tonight is Jane Vieux. Um, she was born in France and little is known about her life. Uh, she composed some 100 pieces, including orchestral music, chamber pieces, operettas, and piano and vocal works, some of which were published under the pseudonym, pseudonym Pierre Vallette. She started composing at age 11 and studied composition with Jules Massenet. And although she lived well into the 20th century, her music remained squarely 19th century in style. And she was not a performer herself. The dedications to some of her songs suggest that she had ties to Parisian musical theater. Um, and from 1907 on, she managed a publishing company with her husband Maurice. And from 1907 onward, he published her songs for her. She published a book of vocalises designed for use in the Paris Conservatory and dedicated the book to its director, Gabriel Faure. And Sleeping Beauty, um, the subject of the song I'm singing today, was also the subject of one of her operatic works and the subject of this valse chante, which means a sung waltz. And popular vocal waltzes were a musical staple of France's Belle Epoque, which means beautiful era which was from 1871 to 1914, and this was a time when the arts flourished in Paris. And these waltzes were heard in public cafe concerts throughout Paris. And the song was written in 1902. And I've talked to a lot of people um, and mentioned that I'm singing this song, and they have never heard of her or have never heard of the song, so I'm glad that I get to bring it to, to life tonight. So, hope you like it. <laughs>
before we close out the program tonight, I do just want to say thank you to all of you for coming. We had a really good time putting this together. And I do think we need to give a big round of applause to Rachel for putting this together.
um, there was so much talk about like masculine and feminine aesthetics of music, and so much talk about um, female composers, you know, either composing music that was too feminine or trying too hard to compose music that was too masculine, and they were caught in this catch-22 where they just couldn't succeed. And because she was kind of sheltered from that, I think her music comes from a deeply personal place. It's not socio-political in any way. It's it's just about. Um, human emotion and human passion, and I think it has some very strong masculine and feminine elements. Um, so it's really beautiful, and I hope you enjoy it as much as I have enjoyed learning it. <laughs>
Om 